the stage. And as our panelists are coming up, I just want to plant the first seed of the first question I'm going to ask you as an audience as soon as they're done with their brief opening remarks. So here goes. I'd love for you to think about this and be ready because we're going to squeeze everything we can out of our conversation. And at the end, there will be cookies. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Um, so, so this play was written 2,500 years ago, roughly, by Euripides and performed in uh, ancient Athens um, at a moment at which the gods and the religion of classical Greece were now really being called into question. And you see that tension in the play, um, even in the opening speeches where um, Cadmus and Tiresias say to Pentheus, even if you don't believe, just respect and have reverence for the thing that Dionysus represents. So whether Euripides believed in the gods or not, whether he was attacking them or he was um, um, expressing reverence for them with his last play, these are all academic debates, I'm not so interested in them. But just for the context of our discussion, um, it's clear that Euripides was saying something, whether, whether it was about the gods or not, about intoxication, about ecstasy, about uh, the power of this force in the world. There's this amazing line where uh, Teresia says, I would rather wage war against the ocean than against this god. So thinking about Dionysus as intoxication, the question I'd love for you to think about is simply, what do you think this guy Euripides was doing when he brought 17,000 people together, citizens um, together, and he performed this play for them? What was he trying to say about intoxication? What was he up to? And we're going to come back to that in a few seconds. Before we do, I'm going to turn things over to our panel and let our panelists introduce themselves so you can hear who they are as it pertains to what they have to say. What I forgot to mention is ever making the best eye contact gets to go first. So you, sir, have volunteered yourself. Um, no pressure. Um, but just, want, just introduce yourself and launch directly into your comments. Yes, my name is Joseph Kearney. Uh, I'm a retired Command Sergeant Major, United States Army Rangers. Excuse me. Um, I'm actually in a program at the moment um, for substance abuse, and I related to basically to every character that was in there, especially um, how Dionysus, Dionysus was the god. And to me, that represented the drugs and alcohol that um, I used in, in my life and how it enslaved me, and I couldn't break free from it. Um, and the out of control feeling of, um, excuse me, how Pentheus' mother, when she killed him, she didn't remember and didn't realize that she killed her own son. And I related that to the things that I've done in life and woke up and say, I did what? And that's a really scary thought. Um, and this was amazing to me. It, it made me look back at a lot of things um, that I haven't really thought about in a long time. and that I guess I really need to look at some more. Um, and really, that, that was it. I thought it was fantastic. Thank you so much for being first. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Emily DeBias, and I am delighted to be here tonight. I am with Mount Sinai St. Luke's Hospital. Um, where addicts, alcoholics, um, psychiatric patients um, can go to detox and rehab and get the help they need. Um, I myself am also in recovery, so I did, um, you know, I felt the connection there uh, when you were holding your son's head and forgetting uh, the tragedy and the dancing in the woods and et cetera, but um, I'm happy to be here tonight, so yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Sir. Welcome and peace. My name is Neil Berry. I'm executive director of Open Arms Center of Hope, which is a human trafficking and domestic violence organization on Staten Island, which happens to have a very big problem with um, this opioid addiction that we're talking about. I've been in recovery, but I've done my recovery through what they call celibate recovery. So I related to the God part because um, I almost thought it was Christian in some of it. <laughs> You know, so I said, wow, gods, and that we do have an intoxication with God sometimes. Anything can be an intoxication, and that's what got me into this thing, is that I got caught up in the drug thing, too. But once you start, this is a progression. So it's not going to stop as soon as you start, you know. So my biggest thing is that I saw through this whole play with the Pantheus. He didn't believe in all this stuff in the beginning, but then he understood once he got hit, it was no stopping. This is a, 
situation where when you get intoxicated with anything, it doesn't necessarily be drugs, but it will take you to the next level. So I just, you know, I want to tell you that this is a progression. It's nothing to start in recovery. It's a lifetime experience. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. How you doing? My name is Reese Bazilli. I'm an uh, employment specialist with Bronx Connect, which is a, uh, an organization that works with at-risk and court-involved youth. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful organization. I brought a bunch of my kids out. Kids, let me hear it. So I brought my kids out um, to see this, because what I really want to do is I want them to be connected to our community and to the things we're doing. Um, and they come from oftentimes marginalized, they're, they're marginalized, they come from urban environments, and they don't often receive the attention that the rest of the people in our city receive. So tonight they're getting our attention. Um, one thing that spoke to me, um, because, and I, I'm thinking from, from the standpoint of incarceration and arrests, one thing that really spoke to me was when we were talking about, when Josh was speaking about infidels, um, who are the infidels, right? And quite often our youth who are, you know, immersed in, in this difficult space, right, called life and called being a teenager and being, being called young, they don't have the options. They don't have many options. The education's not there. So maybe they turn to crime or maybe they just made a mistake because they're impressionable. That's because that's what youth do, right? They make mistakes. So the infidel for them is the officer. It's the police officer. It's the judge. It's the criminal justice system. It's the cops. It's the COs at the prison at Rikers Island. Um, and unfortunately, the officers and the cops and the judges feel too often feel the same way about the kids. They're the infidels. So that really spoke to me, and I hope that we can touch on that a little bit more as we go further tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all four panelists, your terrific panel, and just for your openness, your candor, for getting us started. As I mentioned before, this is going to be a very lively conversation in the audience. I'm going to turn my back to you, but not out of disrespect. And you have four live mics, like the voice of Dionysus. You can come back into the conversation whenever you feel so moved. I hope you will. Um, sometimes I get accused of ignoring the panel, but I know you won't be uh, quiet, so I appreciate that. Um, I have a mic, and there's a second mic, and we have a full house tonight, which we're so delighted by tonight. Um, with folks from all over the city. And just return to the question that I started with a few seconds ago. Um, now that you've seen these actors going for broke, trying to make sense of this 2,500-year-old play, it's a really hard play. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging play. It's almost like a, a Quentin Tarantino script in a certain way. You know, it, it's, it, you're laughing and it's violent at the same time. And it takes a lot to pull it off. It made, they made it look so easy. And then these wonderful panelists come up and make such personal connections. Um, now that you've seen that and heard that and you thought about the play from 2,500 years ago about this ancient god Dionysus, what do you think the playwright, the writer of this story, Euripides, was doing? Or what was he trying to say? Because it's not 100% clear, so uh, we throw it to you. What are you trying to say about intoxication? Is a hand over here? Uh, do you mind pulling the lights up just slightly? Um, was there a hand over here? If your hand comes above your shoulder, I'll be all over you. Um, <laughs> What was he trying to say about intoxication? What was he trying to do? What was he up to? Now, in every audience, no matter big or small, there's always one extremely kind person. <laughs> Is that you? Usually a most intelligent person in the room <laughs> who puts us all out of the misery of long silence. Do you understand? Hi, my name is Aaron Perez. I'm also um, from um, St. Luke's, uh, Mount Sinai. Um, in my humble interpretation, I think basically you're getting different points of view on just um, addiction in general. You have the people who really don't know too much about it. Uh, you have the people who are um, at first against it, but once you start hearing so much about it, you become this curiosity like arises. And it's almost to the point where they're so against it that um, that extreme gets pushed to the other extreme where they really just start wondering and fantasizing about it and actually want to try it out themselves. And um, it, the people who, who are already intoxicated defend it to such an extent because they're so immersed in it. So they really, they're, they're kind of hypnotized by it. And then the people on our side start becoming a little <coughs> attracted to it. Whether it's a, a good thing or a bad thing, they want to find out for themselves. And I think in general, that's what addiction is or just, you know, um, intoxication. Uh, when you're non-intoxicated, you think you're thinking clearly until you actually want to experience it. And once you experience it, 
you get lost in it. And you basically do anything to keep that same momentum going. And you just want to be a part of it. And you want to defend it. And it's almost like the kid outside of the party. They're seeing everyone talking about what's going on. And eventually they get drawn to it. And before they know it, they're immersed in it. And they're fully a, a, a full participant in it. I mean, that's just what I thought. That's what I got from it. Terrific. Thank you so much for being the first. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I should have mentioned at the beginning, I was just rapid fire trying to introduce the play that um, both Pentheus and Dionysus are sort of teenagers. Um, Dionysus is a new god and Pentheus is a new king. And there's a theory that Greek drama was a form of storytelling for adolescents, that in fact the choruses would have been played by youth. Um, so I never thought of what you just said. I mean, you said many things, but one of the things that really hit me while you were talking was, I was thinking about all the ways, there's that moment in the play where Pentheus uh, changes gears and talks about how he wants to see, and maybe he's the guy outside the party, as you say, he wants to see what's going on, but I keep thinking about how we, the, maybe the sober, or the people who d don't identify as being in recovery even, um, consume the narratives and stories of people who are uh, struggling with substance abuse and addiction, and even sort of take pleasure from watching film, television, reading books about it, and even being near it in a certain way. Maybe that's something I never, I never thought about that until you said that right then. I think it's a really powerful thought. Um, of course, Pentheus has his first taste and is destroyed the first time, which I want to get to in a couple seconds. But um, is that a hand there? It's a hand over here, and I won't neglect this side of the audience, but I'll come over here. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, I thought it was a, a great depiction of watching Dionysus slip through the faults in Patheos, the king's values, whatever his set of values you could watch Dionysus um, just slip through. And he took advantage of, slowly he took advantage of certain, certain values that you know, he may have uh, struggled with. And that's a really great parallel with a person that may have broken values and how drugs kind of handle and you know, solve all your problems on the surface, or it may seem like that it handles, you know, and um, just that parallel, just, just watching watching it take advantage of, of it, like you said, a teenager's, um, you know, values is, uh, that's just what happens. So yeah, I thought that was good. Thank you, thank you so much, I really appreciate I kinda, that. Kind of understand yeah. what you were saying about the values, it's your behaviors that changes, as, as I was saying, as a progression, because it looks like, you know, the younger Greeks, as you get um, progressing in this, in this type of thing, your behavior definitely is going to change. So you got to look at the signs. If I was a person looking to see somebody, and I would look at their behavior, the changing of their behavior, especially teenagers. So behavior is values because you, you have some values innate, but your behavior start changing. Things that they really didn't, shouldn't be bothering you before now bother you. So mm -hmm. behavior is one of the most critical things that we try to change mm -hmm. when we talk about recovery. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what this whole process is about. This is what I'm saying about, about the addiction though. Yeah. Because addiction is the final, <laughs> you know, you're gonna go through the whole process. The addiction is when you've got, you, you're dependent on it. It's not no more longer abuse. And you just can't, you know, you cannot physically get up there. So the stigma is about the addiction. They can't handle what, the, they have no idea what the addiction is. They can handle the fact that you might just party off it or do all that. But once the addiction becomes like stealing from the family, stealing from your brothers and sisters, that's when it becomes a problem, you know, when you change those kind of behaviors. But it's not, it's, we, we, we assume addiction is like when the person just picks up a joint or he, just, you know, he has a, he takes opioid pill for one time. No, this is a process and it's, it's going to take a while before you realize that that person's still in denial and the family will too. So we mm -hmm. have to be strong about the word addiction because yeah. addiction is a strong word. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, sir. You know, that, that's interesting. I, one thing that spoke to me was when we were talking about religion yeah. and, you know, in fact, opioids have become the new religion in this country. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a, heck of a lot of followers and the uh the base is growing every day and it and and there's no end in sight and uh, too little's been done too late and what i what i'm curious to know i think this is a cautionary tale um but i don't think it's a cautionary tale for the individual i think it's a cautionary tale for every one of us in society to do our own part in <coughs> resolving situations like this maybe before they happen Unfortunately, we're getting this play tonight too late. Um, 
even though it was written 2,500 years ago, right? Um, so it just makes me wonder, we're thinking about addiction, we're thinking about these Band-Aids, right? Addiction is often a Band-Aid for some other underlying issue or problem or emotion or pain. So what can we do to mitigate those things before they happen? That's one thing I want to start thinking about more. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And, you know, bringing the question of religion or, or spirituality into the room is really, I think, powerful because it's in the play. It's right there on the surface. And the play sort of in the tension between its own religious rights, which have to do with intoxication, and its own piety toward those rights raises a whole series of questions. What do we as humans need and why? Are, are we filling ourselves with opioids as a culture right now, as, as you suggest, instead of uh, seeking health and, and other, um, yeah. Um, as an addict in recovery, um, you know, on my side, it's uh, looking for that higher power to fill the needs uh, instead of using the drug. That higher power could be God, it could be um, this water bottle, it could be anything, but, um, for me and for others, uh, finding that higher power is uh, gonna teach me. Uh, and I need to hold strong to that. And this is a family disease, uh, I believe that, so thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, I appreciate that. There's been someone waiting over here, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'd like to make a comment on what the gentleman on the end said about um, this being a, pro a progression, but what do you do? It seemed like um, in this presentation, there was uh, only chaos <laughs> and there was no redemption for anyone. Um, one of the things that struck me was it, several points in the play, it showed the need for control. Like there's an illusion of control that happens um, when the king, he first wanted to be in disguise, he wanted to do this, that, and the other thing to uh, participate but not be seen. And th he thought he could control what was going to happen, even though it was very clear he was being told straight up he was gonna die by the hands of his mother. And um, he also did what society does with problems like this and thought that um, strict punishments and violence could control this problem. And I think it's very fitting that there was no solution at the end because um, addiction, I feel, can stand on its own as a thing. You know, we often say uh, it's, not, it's not the person, it's the disease when something is happening. And it's, it's learning about the disease and taking uh, the measures you need to take to stop the disease that is going to help people. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, there are so many things you said we could respond to, but the one that really resonates so much with what we've been doing and all the conversations we've been having across the city, across many of our projects, is, I mean, Pentheus, all he, I never thought about it this way, the way you said it, but really all he does is throw incarceration at Dionysus. Violence toward the women, incarceration toward the women, incarceration. And the, and the third time that the God breaks free, because effortlessly you can transcend any boundary. Incarceration doesn't work. Of course, we know in our prisons and jails the, the, the rates of uh, drug use are higher if, you know, than, than in, on the streets. So um, uh, he throws it, he, he says, I'm gonna lock, do you wanna be locked up again? And you know, just a little backing up, you know, we, this work was commissioned. I, I translated this play back when I was 20 years old in college, not knowing where it would take me. Um, but about, eight years ago or nine years ago, the, the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, which was the group that developed This Is Your Brain on Drugs, the egg commercial, which for many of us we associate with the just sort of just say no era, even though it maybe not have been the same strategy. Um, trying to make addiction or substance abuse visible was sort of the strategy, but it was a time when we were being told almost like a total prohibition a kind of white-knuckled, violent response toward, toward drugs um, that pervaded not just the right, but the left. That the left was responsible for the Rockefeller drug laws and the, and the over-incarceration of black and brown communities and uh, the, um, the, just sort of the wholesale criminalization of the disease of addiction. 
And so I think it's really powerful that you bring that into the room, because I never really thought about it that way, that Pentheus, in some ways, really does speak to the present moment, and even to some of the questions at work in our current um, Department of Justice with how do we deal with this. After having made some progress, we still as a nation are very divided about whether we throw violence at this, or shame, or stigma, or if there, we use a drug court model, or if we use a rehabilitation model, or if we decarcerate and get mental health and addiction treatment out in the communities. And we, don't, we haven't decided, we're as polarized as Pentheus and Dionysus as a society with regard to this question. And th there was a strong possibility that, um, I read the cliff notes last night, and I think uh, <laughs> Pentheus may have been related to, to Rudy Giuliani. So <laughs> we're gonna look, you might know, you're the historian. So. Okay, here you go, sir. How you doing, my name's Nikki Serrano, I'm with uh, Odyssey House. Um, pretty much what I got from that uh, story is, it's mainly the root of addiction, it's where it all stems from. You know, uh, Pentheus, to me, I don't agree with some of his methods, especially with trying to incarcerate and lock up, uh, agreeing with what the fellow people had said, but also what he was saying was making sense because he was not, in, in so to speak, addicted. He was not following what was going on. He didn't give in to just, oh, just trying this one time. He was level-headed and agreed that, you know what, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what's going on over there, but to me it's not the normal. Whatever our women are doing, they shouldn't be doing because that's not what they have ever done. You know, um, but also at the end of the day, he fell victim to, I feel like, being an addict because it was very easily manipulated. You know, um, Diana, Diana, uh, Dionysus, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, um, was manipulation was on key. You know, he, had, he said what he needed to say, he did what he needed to do, and he perceived and gave the image, he portrayed what he wanted to, to eventually get it, just like addiction would does. You know what I mean? Uh, myself, I am in recovery. Um, and I have fell victim to that multiple times. And I've tried, and I have had years sober, and then I've fallen. And you know what I mean? It's the manipulation, it's the sense of entitlement. To me, it's the... It's the attitudes and behaviors that lead you to addiction. When I was growing up and my mother and father were raising me, I didn't have the idea that I was going to be a recovering addict at 26 years old. Um, you know what I mean? It was a great play. Um, thank you for letting me share. You know what's so important about what you just said? This whole room has been talking about one thing I want. I thought it was the first step that we all been taking in recovery is power and control. Yeah. All this is about power and control. It's whether it be addiction, whether it be domestic violence, whether it be trafficking, these are men and women who lose power and control. It, everything we do in society, when women, when you said women versus women, women versus men, everything is going back into this power and control that we can constantly are at fight with in this society. Whether it be teenagers or adults, it's all about power and control. Yeah, thank you. And before I come over here, I just throw in that Dionysus is a god of contradictions. So if this, con if this conversation gets complicated, or if we find ourselves taking oppositional views or in making different interpretations, that's fine because that's part of, I think, why he's the, the god of theater. Because the play, as someone already represented, represents a variety of perspectives mm -hmm. where everyone feels they're right. Um, but Dionysus is called Lucios, which is the liberator. The person who liberates you from the boundaries of your life and from what defines you. And he's also called Bromios, the thunderer, the destroyer. And he's both, and he's not either or. It's not either Pentheus. And so just mentioning that, and I, I'm going to come over here, but after you, sir, I'm going to ask a second question and then maybe a third before we get to the cookies. And um, you can ignore my questions. You can answer the question, the first question as it comes to you, but I want to shift us into a couple other themes as we move through the conversation. Sir, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Greg, and I'm a recovering heroin addict um, with Non Sinai. Um, I've been battling with heroin addiction for the last 10 years. Um, there used to be a large gap to heroin. Um, that gap has been closed, it's been bridged, and um, with pharmaceutical drugs. That's how I, you know, um, fell into my addiction. Um, and this play was interesting because it showed how divisive the addiction can be, you know, um, how it disguises itself in some ways, and how easily that is bought into. Um, even using, like, the allure of women was used for, for, for the king, you know, like, there's, it's, a, it, I'm not going to say heroin is attractive, but there is something attractive to a drug lifestyle, in a sense. Um, what winds up happening is that you bite off a lot more than you can chew. Um, for me, it's, I haven't been 
high in a while. I've just been not sick, you know, and maintaining that is something that people not in recovery, they don't understand that I go through. Um, you know, you'll go through the to ends of the earth to, to push that away. And, you know, when, I'm not sure the name of the, the woman that held the head. Oh, Agawe. You know, yeah, right, Agawe. That was so symbolic of, like, what have I done waking up in the morning? You know, I woke up and there's blood, on, proverbial blood on my hands. Like, um, I've, that's happened to me multiple times. It's embarrassing. You know, it's something that now carries a huge stigma. You know, I, it's, I think a lot of dealing with this opioid crisis is removing stigma. We have to get rid of that, you know, um, we have to be like happy about solving this we can't be like look at it like it's a like it's a, a dark you know elephant in the room it really has to, we really have to remove stigma so i think that's very important so thank you so much i think you've done so just now I, by selling your telling your story i really appreciate it may um, i say something yeah uh, please pentheus is told your fame will last for all time and instead his ribs had been stripped bone white um and that was so symbolic to me. Um, Greg, you said it all. Uh, it's not being high anymore. It's getting uh, not sick. So that's huge. Yeah, I'd like to comment too, please. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, this, di this disease does not discriminate. It doesn't matter what walk of life you're from. Um, I mean, this entire room, pretty much everybody does something different. And when I started, at 14 years old, um, it was giggles and laughs. By the time I was 21, when I was in the military, the, the penalties of waking up and saying, oh, what did I do last night, got different. And I've been fighting this disease for 30 years. I've had plenty of time sober, and it gets so strong at times that you could have 30, 40 years, and it will still call you back, and you know, Again, it doesn't discriminate, and we definitely need to address the fact that it's not prejudice. It doesn't care. It will attack you. It'll come on like, like the roses. And then when you take your hand and you go down the rose stem, you get pricked by the uh, thorn. And that's exactly what it does. And when it pricks you, it pricks you very hardly. Thank you so much I, for everything that's been said so far. I'm going to shift gears to a second question. And again, you can just assimilate your answers. You can ignore the question. But I want to move us into another theme really quickly, which is the beginning of the play. We came so far, we, we've barely talked about the first scene. But in the first scene of the play, these two older men, uh, Cadmus, the, the former king, until recently king uh, of Thebes, and uh, Tiresias, the prophet, the religious leader, one of the religious leaders, uh, in their old age, they put on essentially skirts, dappled fawn skin skirts, they, they get fennel rods, and they go to the hills, they're leaving to go dance for Dionysus. So in the play, we have this intergenerational thing happening, in the, even in the beginning, the first scene. And I guess the question is, um, how have you, as members of various communities and backgrounds, seen older members of your community the age of Tiresias or Cadmus, over the spans of their lives, modeling behavior with regard to intoxication and ecstasy and perhaps addiction. Yeah. Um, my name is Daryl. I'm from Brooklyn. I grew up in the 70s, right? When I was younger, we sort of, I was young, I used to just smoke weed. And in Brooklyn, all the old timers had the big swelling hands. And they used to all be on the methadone program. And we used to make fun of them. You know, it was all on dope at that time. That's when dope was ravishing my community in bed stock. And um, I never thought I would, would do that. I never thought I would touch that. But I, I was attracted to the lifestyle. So, you know, then when the crack hit the area, we was all just hustling. You know, you know. I never thought I'd take a one on one of that bag. You know? But I didn't see a lot of things, you know, like the lifestyle come with the you know, we we was thugging it. 
So next you know we doing what we do. Now I'm going through all these juvenile detentions, Spoffitts, Rackets Island, graduated to the state penitentiary. You know, I'm I'm just I'm totally indoctrinated with the game. I'm just you can't get me out of it now. I'm all the way in. So I never thought that I'd be battling Haron doing it. You know what I'm saying? And I was attracted to the lifestyle. People doing coke and all that. At that time it was fly. You know, it was no more weed no more. You know? Now my son and them, they doing ecstasy. So, but what I see with the play is like, it's nothing new under the sun. You know what I'm saying? That's been going on for thousands of years. And now it's, it's ravishing, you know? But I've been getting locked up for a bag of dope. And nobody was trying to offer me no program, you know? It was like, you see what I'm saying? Now, the, now people getting strung out from going to the doctors and all that, you know? It's just not no street thing no more. So you got old ladies going to cop. You got old ladies in the program. You got babies running around in the program right now. They don't even know what they're getting themselves into. You see what I'm saying? Next thing you know, they're in the penitentiary. So I think a gram of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You see what I'm saying? If you don't get it now, if you don't, if you don't groom them now for, for what they're going to come, because they're not, they don't, re I didn't respect nobody. You couldn't tell me nothing at that time. So now I'm open because I done been through it. You see what I'm saying? So, but I can't really, I, my son is, he, he buck wow. I can't really, and he already know what I went through. It's like, yo, you see what I went through. I done been through every state penitentiary. You know what I'm saying? I really lived this. You a PlayStation cat trying to be down. You understand what I'm saying? He not really about that. He, 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 he infatuated with them rap cats that, Yo, they ain't, none of them ain't busting no grapes, no really, they ain't never did nothing. But he infatuated with that, that lifestyle from a distance. So I just say, we gotta groom him, we gotta catch him now, you know? I'm, I'm trying to do my thing, I ain't, I, you know, I've been clean for like nine months now. Amen. I'm in St. Luke's, that's the best program. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, we just got, we gotta, we gotta, you gotta build a team up to go out there and, and reach the minds of the youngsters so they all know that it's nothing fly about that. But right now, they just attract to the game, that's all. Thank you so much, you know, I really appreciate that. That was Thank an you. important. Thank you. He used the word prevention. Yeah. And uh, as a public health student, that's, that's the name of the game, right? There was a line, hang this head from the highest peak for all to see, right? And that was, that's what Ronald Reagan did. That's why there's mass incarceration. And we see how that's going. It's not working, right? So prevention is the key. So thank you for saying that word. Thank you both so much. Um, and there was something you said, sir, that I, I'd never thought about. Well, the analogy you made I thought was so powerful, the idea that um, Pentheus sees uh, these older members of the community doing this thing, and he says, oh, well, here's a ridiculous sight. You know, and when you said swollen hands from methadone, um, you know, I'd never, I could never have made that connection, but what a powerful connection to make. Um, the youth never see themselves in the older generation. Um, that's, that's the human condition. Um, and uh, so I really appreciate all that you share, but that, that really struck me. Um, does anyone else want to take on this? Or perhaps you want to answer your own question, but you've had your hand up. Hey, how you doing, Freddie? Uh, I just want to say uh, great job to these four actors for that riveting play. Great job. Uh, I just want to say uh, I relate with the king because one can be uh, oblivious and negligent to what's around him until, for example, he's seen the women in the hill on the mountains doing what they do. That ties into modern day. You could find yourself in, in a Rikers Island bullpen and say, "Wow, how did I get here?" And that's when you find out that's it's real. I just want to say, uh, I was always younger with the older members of the community, like the older kids. You see them driving nice cars, da da da. And uh, it's appealing, but you don't see the inside of that and what goes on behind that until, for, for example, you could be fighting a felony, and that, that's when it gets real. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, 
There's that incredible moment in the play where Pentheus begs his mother not to take his life, and he says, please don't kill me over one mistake. I believe. Greek tragedy depicts characters um, learning too late. Uh, I would say that Greek, a real functional definition of Greek tragedy is a story in which someone learns milliseconds too late. And in those milliseconds, they've destroyed themselves and their families and generations to come. Now, people sometimes say, well, why do you present plays about people learning too late to audiences who've lived really extreme lives? And I would put forth that part of the reason we do it is to wake audiences up, especially those who haven't led those lives when they hear stories like have been shared in the moments tonight. But also um, because the um, stories also validate or sort of reflect the experiences that many people have, which is to say being punished or killed, so to speak, for one mistake for just being a youth. Now, I was also thinking about what you said, sir, about how Dionysus says to Cadmus, the old king, if you had just remained level-headed and had talked with your grandson. Now, what he said to tell him was that Dionysus was a god. Now, I don't want to complicate things because I really appreciate all the narratives that have been shared where we've made the analogy between Dionysus and addiction. But I also like the idea, just to complicate things for a second, the Dionysus is a force, force of nature that's so powerful that it's not to be trifled with. Mm-hmm. And, that, and, and l- that what Dionysus means when he says to Cadmus is you should have taught your son, your grandson, how powerful I am. And um, so we first did this in Appalachia, in Hazard, Kentucky, in the pill and meth capital of the South. Um, we were driving in, I was going to get the, the cab and there was a cab driver taking me to get, I'm uh, sorry, to get a rental car at the airport because we got in too late the night before. And the cab driver said, uh, don't drive into any hollas you can't drive out of. And I didn't know what that meant, but we drove further and further into Appalachia and it became clear that there were some driveways that were dead ends and that if we had made a wrong turn and we got deeper and deeper into this sort of the wilds of Appalachia and um, And 500 people came out to each performance. And a lot of them were teenagers. And when I asked this question, a young woman in the front raised her hand. She said, I'm the only member of my family who's not using. I'm the only, my parents steal from me. My brother's incarcerated. And all of her friends sort of fell upon her and she sort of bawled and cried as she told her narrative. But this was what ground zero in Appalachia looks like. Of course, we've done this in urban America too and it doesn't look any different. And we've also done performances in places like Staten Island where we've had um, sort of mixed race audiences where we've had the hard conversation that the opioid epidemic has existed for a very long time. And it's because it's hit the white community that we're having this conversation, that we're here having this conversation right now. And so that's been part of our conversations as we've tried to serve all of New York City moving from borough to borough. I'm going to shift gears to a third question, but again, you can um, jump in with anything and just remember the cookies that await at the end of our conversation where we can have more uh, casual conversation together. Um, They're really good cookies. We we decide just to get the same cookies every type, every night. This is, um, by the way, I didn't mention at the beginning, this is part of a six performance series and we have two more. Um, The next one next month is May 3rd, which is the theater of law. Anyone who's ever felt disenfranchised by the law, that's the audience, which is like, 99% 99% of America, um, and certainly the 96% of us who never get our day in court. Um, so come to that one. The next one after that is called um, Prometheus in Prison. It's about mass incarceration, and um, it'll be here in this space as well. So this is part of our ongoing series. Um, so I, I just want to just go a little bit deeper on what happens to Pentheus. So Pentheus um, comes off as kind of a very conservative patriarchal, misogynistic, Excuse sort of me. angry person, no problem. And, um, and he uh, seems to be white knuckling in a certain way, his interest in Dionysus. And Dionysus has this incredible line. He says, the rights are hostile to the non-believer. So the idea that someone could approach ecstasy or, or intoxication with, uh, without belief or reverence for its power, that they could be destroyed. It's sort of baked into the, the, the idea. So Pentheus tries to incarcerate the women. He tries to incarcerate Dionysus. He, um, 
tries to, he yells at his elders, he um, essentially creates a police state with regard to this issue and it just keeps cropping back up and he can't subdue it. And finally Dionysus offers him, would you like to go to the hills and see for yourself? And the whole place sort of shifts in this entirely new direction. Pentheus goes to the hills and as the messenger speech tells us, um, he finds himself immersed, as someone said earlier, completely subsumed in the intoxication, the ecstasy, after having drunk something that Dionysus gave him that led him into the hills. And then not only is he destroyed by his first taste of this intoxicant, but his bones are stripped white. And his aunt has one of his feet in a laced up boot in her mouth. Um, the great director Andre Gregory, I don't know if you've ever seen this film, My Dinner with Andre, says that he, when he directed this play at Yale in the 60s, he wished he could go to the morgue to get a head so that he could pass it around the audience because the play is funny and then it's not. And to really drive home, this is life and death we're talking about. So the question is simply this, Pentheus is destroyed by his first taste of intoxication. Is that something that you can relate to or that you've seen or you could speak to? And your hand's been up for a while. I hope you'll. Um, hi, me again. Um, it brings me to a point that I've heard other people um, bring up in um, rehabs, multiple rehabs I've been in. Uh, my drug of choice is alcohol. But I've heard many times from people who use different drugs saying that there was a point in their addiction when they saw someone really sick or nodding out or overdosed. And instead of being afraid of using that drug, they were attracted to it. They say, I want to have what he's having. Or where'd you get that? And it just brings to light the fact that I feel I'm 37 years old. When I first started experimenting with drugs, marijuana, alcohol, I did it to escape myself, to get high, to get a good feeling. I feel now with youth, they're not trying to get high. I think they're trying to kill themselves at one point. The drug epidemic now is to a serious state where kids are dying. The drugs are stronger, they're more synthetic, they're more potent. And the curiosity is no longer, oh, I want to get high, is I want to be laying down like he is or she is. And that's scary when you think about it. I mean, I read something where kids are sniffing condoms now, snorting condoms. This is true. Yes, this is true. But what I'm saying is the point is it's not even, it's not to be fun anymore. Now it's just people are dying from it. They're trying to kill themselves. So when does curiosity become flat out insanity? So it brings me again to the point that this, is, this epidemic has reached a, a level now where it needs our attention now. And prevention, like was, it was mentioned earlier, I think it's, 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 it's optimal now. It's no longer a choice. We need to prevent this before it gets out of hand because whole generations are going to be dying. Thank you so much. I really appreciate There's a hand right here and back here. I'll come to yours too. Um, we were just in New Hampshire last week in the opioid uh, capital uh, near Keene and Manchester doing a different project. And in the little town we were in, there have been 100 overdoses since January 1. Um, the, the high school students described Manchester to us when we went to meet with them like walking dead. They said people would be just on park benches and they would die, or they'd be walking out into traffic. Um, and so when you describe this sort of apocalyptic scenario, we just came last week from a state in a, a place where they were living it too and it, I don't think we could, like Greek tragedy isn't extreme enough to describe the situation in our country right now. So I really appreciate everything you said. Thank you, my name is Valerie. Um, Pentheus's curiosity was sparked from the old men speaking, from the stories about the women, uh, from the other gentlemen, I forget his name, but we told him the story about the women and killing the ox and the pig and the cows and all that sparked his his curiosity. And then he then when he heard um when he when 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 the the stranger um 
the, the, the person of the story we were talking about. Uh, yeah, him. Yeah. When he uh, offered all these things to him, he couldn't help but knowing what he knows that this, this is going to do this, knowing what he knows, he, was still, he couldn't resist. So once he got a taste of it, it eventually, it, that's what took him out. And even though he had an idea that this was dangerous, it was dangerous to go to this place. So I think that's, um, that's where I could see what you're saying about kids are dying, you know, even though they know that this is, this is killing people around them, but they still want to try it. You, sir, are one of our best customers. I will try to come back to you. I'm going to try to get a few other people. How you doing? My name is Raymond. I'm from Bronx Connect. I'm here with my program now. Um, I would just like to say that, like, at the end of the day, I'm coming from the Bronx. Like, all you see is people nodding off drugs and all that extraness. You understand? It's, and I'm hearing the prevention word, like, Prevent to prevent. How you how are you gonna prevent something that's already? Oh, it's gonna be there. No matter how many people you send to rehab, no matter how many people go get help, get better, it's always gonna be there. It's always gonna be in the streets. So so it's it's, it's to to relapse is it's it's so easy nowadays. You understand? So it's like it's 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 it got to do a lot with willpower. And it's, but at the end, it's hard. Like if it's all you're surrounded by, like I'm I'm when I'm growing up, everybody's on you know chilling, having fun, drinking beers, smoking on. You, f you get lured into it. It's the, it's the temptation, you understand? Like, oh, he's going around feeling like that. I wonder how that feels. That's how it starts. And then it, and from there, it could slip as easily just from starting something as little as, you know, a little weed here and there to serious drugs. And now you out here killing yourself. And it's not, and then to the point where it's like, you're addicted, you can't stop. So how are you gonna stop, you understand? Like, so it's hard, my, but can my- I, can, I, can I add one? All right. <clears throat> Name is Eddie. Um. I want to add on to on my fellow Bronx Connect for me. Um, so yeah, basically what he's saying is like, if you're not ready to like people like I, right, people can be sent to do um rehab all that, but if you're not ready, you're not it's not working. You just gonna be there, waste your time, come out and still be doing the same thing you're doing. And I would and what he was somebody said over there about um people see. Now people see like other people like they see the drugs they using so they then they want to be the same way. Yeah. It's like like some people like they go through a lot of stuff so it's like like yeah like like they like they take drugs basically to to make them feel better but it's not gonna make you feel better forever. It's gonna make you feel better at that moment, mm -hmm. at that moment. But the pain not gonna go away. It's still gonna come back after you sober or whatever. For me, so like. Yeah, I feel like people just use drugs just to like, just to just feel better at that moment, and then yeah, as a cover up. Sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead, jump on. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Let, I I like to hear from my little, my young brothers. For me, when I was their age, I thought I was. I was, I thought I was that man. I thought I was that dude. You hear me? But at the end of the day, I was a follower. You understand what I'm saying? I wasn't being groomed for leadership. I was being groomed to follow. I already had my mind, I already had in my mind I'm going to the penitentiary. I already knew that. I didn't see college in me. I didn't see 21. I didn't have nobody to, to plant seeds in my garden so it grow into something. I ain't had nobody to cultivate my mind. I couldn't think past the next day because tomorrow wasn't promised. So I was hustling fast and trying to, you know, Dodge the bullet, but I knew it was coming. You see what I'm saying? If if you going for leadership, then you're not gonna follow. You you gonna set trends. You ain't gonna follow the trends. I knew the trap was around. I seen the dope fiends. I seen them. They was my uncles, my aunts, my moms, my fathers. I seen that. I knew that. So I can't even make the excuse of saying that yo I didn't know what was gonna happen because I saw them Leonardo, Spike Lee in it. Mm -hmm. And I went and followed them. I, already, my, I made a promise to my mom I would never sniff cocaine. And I, I, yo, when she seen me nodding, the, the hurt that I seen in her face, I, I can't, I, yo, listen. But I, I, I never saw it coming. I never thought that that's going to happen to me or that's going to be me. 
You know what I'm saying? But the bottom line is either you're going to be a leader or you're going to be a follower. I like to address the one issue that you talked about. The young brother, he said something interesting. There's a lot of issues that brothers go through. You don't know what the next man's walking in. So you can't really say what exactly is turning people to what, because there are underlying issues, and that's how we get to the root of these problems. That's what recovery is all about. So you do have hope, because if you get to the underlying issues, because it's not necessarily the addiction to the drug, it is the issue that you got to get to. Maybe the poverty, the racism. You know, we have different type of treatments. We may be not discriminatory, but treatment is different. The way we treat certain populations in treatment is totally different than we treat treat the white population. You talk about Staten Island. Staten Island didn't have that problem, as you said, until the white population got involved in it. And it's a nationwide thing going the same way. The treatment you get in the urban areas is not the treatment you get in, in, in a highly affluent area. So we have to be very careful about how we say what issues are there, because there are issues that are underlying this, this whole thing. It's not going to be helped by, and this is a community thing. We keep using, not losing that word called community. If these communities don't get together, like Staten Island is losing it because their community refuses to not allow the stigma to get in the way that someone talked about. They don't want to, they want to be in denial that it doesn't exist in their community and they don't need social services. Many affluent uh, communities believe that. Middle class people, you know, think they're a little snobbish. I'm coming to you because I've been in recovery for over 20 years. And I know, and I've listened, let me tell you something, recovery works. I've been an executive director for the last 10 years and I've been clean and it works, but you gotta do what you gotta do. He mentioned, he, he, Raymond asked about prevention. What, what can I do, right? This is prevention tonight, Raymond. All you Bronx, can I, well, everybody here. This is prevention tonight. We have a veteran on the stage, a strong man who fought for us, for our country, the strongest of the strong. And he was affected by this disease, right? And I'm sure, despite his strength, he didn't feel maybe as strong as he once was. But he's up here today. Word of mouth, he's giving you his story so that you can become stronger, so that this, wasn't, this won't happen to you. This young lady, she doesn't look like a drug addict to me, <laughs> right? No way. No this way. guy is a director of a program, right? These people all have these stories. They've been there. This is your prevention. So word of mouth gets these drugs, your friend tells you, oh, that looks cool, that feels good, and you see it and you hear about it, that's word of mouth, right? Well, somebody, I used to sell vacuum cleaners door to door people. <laughs> and they told me word of mouth is the best sales. It's better than any other form of advertising. But guess what? This tonight is word of mouth from my mouth to your ears. Okay? Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Um, thank you, everything has been said on this topic. We have time for maybe one more question, and I'm going to just throw it at you. And then, of course, if you had something burning within you to say, jump all over it and, and say it. Um, but we just let this ride for a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll adjourn to, uh, to our cookies. So, um, so there's something really remarkable about this play, and we were talking about it a little bit in rehearsal tonight. We, um, Dionysus comes to Greece, he sets the women free. We haven't even talked about the misogyny in the play. Maybe we should just come back and do a different panel and, <laughs> and just address the underlying theme of, you know, how threatening it is for this society for women to become the hunters and men to become the hunted. Um, oh my goodness, um, you know, um, what will we do? The very fabric of society is gonna fall apart because women are doing men's jobs and men are doing women's. And, um, the, 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 the depth of the violence that comes from this king and from this culture with regard to the women being liberated by this God and this foreign God, right? So there are so many things we could talk about. But I wanted to talk about the end of the play because it's really problematic. Scholars don't know what to do with it, but I think this audience will. So at the end of the play, um, after everything that's happened, um, Agawe killing her own son and arriving in Thebes with his head on a spear and showing everyone and thinking that it's a lion that she's hunted um, and bragging about it and then coming to consciousness of what she has done. She says, when Cadmus says, do you see, what do you see? Is it's no longer a head, she's, uh, you're, uh, no longer a lion. She says, I see the greatest grief. And you feel that this woman couldn't imagine something worse than what's happened to her. And the play could simply end there. 
but instead Dionysus appears in the old way it was called the deus ex machina, a crane brought in the actor from the sky playing Dionysus and no longer is he a, just a preacher or a sort of god in, in uh, human clothing or mortal clothing, he's this resplendent you know, um, embodiment of a god flying in over the, and when I directed this the first time he came in in a car, like a Buick um, we were doing this outdoors, and, and it was filled with the Bakkins, and it was sort of bouncing, and people were, anno like this sort of theater-going audience was annoyed that someone was driving onto our set, and then out stepped Dionysus. And anyway, no matter how you do it, Dionysus appears, and he says to Cadmus, who begs him to stop, too late. You should have called me a god, and you're going to become a snake, and the next generation will become a snake, and you're going to wander from land to land. And the very people who worshipped him at the beginning of the play, who were going off to you know, dance in reverence for the god, they're destroyed alongside the ones who didn't believe. In fact, at the end of this play, everyone and everything is subsumed in the violence of this god. Everyone is destroyed. So when an entire community is destroyed, how does it move forward? Um, what can you relate to this ending? Does it speak to your experience or your vision for our present moment? Or is it dissonant? What do you think of this ending in which everything and everyone no matter what they did or didn't do in the play, is destroyed by this God. And I'm going to come over here because I denied you earlier and I felt bad about it, and the, but I know we'll go to some other people who haven't talked as well. Hello. Um, speaking of uh, like real life um, tragedy, so this happened at Nassau Community Medical Center in the, uh, the rehab ward, but a mother came in and gave her son um, like a bundle of heroin and he overdosed and died as he's trying to get you know go through the the detox and this mother killed her son through love it was through you know in a way it's kind of like she didn't want her son to be sick he got on the phone started saying mom I'm sick I'm sick I'm sick help me the mom came she tried to help her son and she killed him like that's like that's a real like a real life version of this real life grief no greater grief than that um and then i try to imagine like what could this woman ever do after that to you know salvage her life because you just lost your son 20 you know but you can through word of mouth you can talk and try to talk of of how powerful this thing is how powerful dionysus is that it's no joke, and uh, you could lose it all. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know somebody's waiting on this side, which we've neglected. Oh, we, we, so we've neglected. Oh, someone on this side of this side. Okay, I got it. I'm coming. Someone over here. Someone over here. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, you guys have spoken. Someone who hasn't spoken. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, what a wonderful performance. I'm so happy to be here this evening. Uh, and kudos to the panelists. Uh, you guys were all wonderful. Um, having such a great time just listening to everybody speak. Uh, amazing. And one of the things that I thought about uh, with this last question, you mentioned the perfect storm. It seems like a perfect confluence of things that are happening in our society. You know, there's changing values, gender norms are kind of in flux. We have uh, situations south of the border with a very kind of toxic president, and I, I hope I don't offend anybody, but uh, with the whole wanting to build a wall, I mean, the, the, the play is rel very relevant. And I know that it's an old play, uh, and I'm not uh, a scholar or know a lot about Greek mythology, but it's just so prescient, and I really appreciate what folks are speaking about, the urgency. I mean, people are dying. Um, I've, I'm new to recovery. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Uh, but in this process of recovery, it started six months ago. I saw myself at the end of an epic marriage that had fallen apart, uh, 
for the most part, you know, I, I was a, a promising youngster when I was looking at my future and all that I was going to accomplish. And in, 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 a, in a lot of ways, I did accomplish a great deal. I managed to graduate from school. I have a master's degree. I became a successful, well, I, what I thought, some modicum of success uh, in my dance career. But one thing I didn't confront was shame. And we are speaking about, you know, with addiction, what, what gets us, what fascinates us about addiction. I think about that wonderful post-Victorian uh, novel, a dry, Diary of a Drug Fiend, and how these people become enamored in this lifestyle of drugs and sex and romance. And, you know, psychiatry really coming to grips at the time with mental illness, and I think that confluence really is about mental illness. For me, shame was underlying the reason for why I used. And so we just have a perfect storm, and there is no greater forum or better opportunity for us to really have a dialogue, because like that documentary about uh, that I saw while in rehab, uh, destigmatizing you know, addiction. Uh, I think a lot of it is shame, and that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it strikes me that even by virtue of our curate, curation of the audience, I want to thank Lisa Fader Fitel, who's our audience curator, for bringing together the groups. Um, I think we have folks from at least six organizations throughout the city. We have WQXR and uh, WNYC listeners. We have people who are just interested in Greek drama. We have students. <laughs> um, that the indiscriminate nature of the destruction of Dionysus is on display in all the narratives, all the stories that have been said tonight. And it's really powerful, just even the two of you sitting next to each other, sharing such powerful narratives, coming from totally different walks of life, I presume, from what you said, and, um, and there being a connection. I really appreciate you mentioning gender, because that's also a theme we haven't had time, and we could probably go eight or nine more hours with all the other themes we could touch upon. Um, but, but I tried to touch upon it with that reference to the loosening of boundaries um, and how threatened Pentheus becomes. Um, does anyone else maybe want to take on this final? Yeah, right here, making my job so easy. Hi, um, I was really interested in the fact that Pantheus, the only person that was like the naysayer or the, the holdout to Dionysus was Pantheus, who was the king um, and had the most to lose from losing that power of his constituents and his people. Um, and then it ties kind of ties into like what to do after a community is shattered and talking about prevention as opposed to discrimination and criminalization. Um, and maybe, maybe if the people making the, uh, maybe if the answers come from a place of altruism instead of like losing power and losing, um, losing maybe votes or a certain demographic or keeping a certain demographic uh, down or immobile, then we can actually talk about uh, prevention instead of criminalization. Thank you, I really appreciate that, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Alan. Um, I'm also a veteran. I'm here with Mr. Joe right here. And um, this is the first time um, I have been to a, a play like this. And it was very interesting. And what I get out of the play is, um, like, um, what I want to say, you know, um, this is how we can overcome this thing, too, by staying connected. Each one teach one, you know, and this is very beautiful. We all get together like this, you know. This is a beautiful all thing. Story time. But um, okay, what I get out of <laughs> what I get out of the play, right, is that um, addiction plays, you know, a play a part on anybody that don't keep their guard up. And you know, once you indulge in um, substance abuse, your life becomes unmanageable, and it plays on guards kings, you know, queens, nobody has good judgment. And what I got out of this, you know, you know, don't discriminate, you know, drugs don't discriminate on anybody, old, young, 
even um, newborns, you know. And the only thing, this play was a wake-up call to me. And the only thing I got to say, we just got to stop sleeping, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's the message of Greek tragedy. We got to stop sleeping. Like, that's, I mean, it's a bad play, obviously. Everyone's going to be asleep. And if you go to many theaters, um, but we had a great group of actors, and they kept us awake. But, but, uh, and also, I love this idea that, that the God we've been talking about this time, this God of theater, the God of storytelling, is the God of um, he, dissolving what separates us. And uh, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, we do these events, and then um, I, for 45 minutes afterwards, I'm talking to everyone I see, and I don't, as a New Yorker, do that, because if I did, my life would be completely consumed with that. And yet, we all suffer from that. Um, not actually taking in or acknowledging the suffering that may be happening to our left and our right, because we have to get through our own day. Um, but theater and this kind of storytelling and the kind of sharing that's happened in the room and the kind of sharing that happens in recovery and the kind of sharing that happens in 12-step programs, that kind of candor, that honesty, that openness shows us how connected we are. And I think once we see, it's very hard not to feel what it's appropriate to feel toward one another. The question is, how long does that last? Um, and how can we make it last longer than 45 minutes together in a room? Um, or maybe a few minutes afterwards in the lobby. Well, this is about awareness, precept prevention, but these programs start off with awareness. Yeah. And if we have an awareness coming, and the only thing I'm gonna say is that it, it works if we just work it. But you know, we have to pat people on to work it. Yeah. And I think that this here is an indication that the awareness, just spread the word and story, tell everybody what you do. Yeah. And the more we do that in our communities about people and our families and, and our friends, because you know what? Everybody in this room has some brokenness in them. There's something bothering everybody in here, you know, so you are just that close to, you know, going to the other side because everyone is broken in here to some degree. That would also be probably one of the messages of Greek tragedy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm really resisting giving you the mic because we have a rule against actors speaking, but Peter, you had your hand, so I'm not gonna, I, I know you're gonna do us crap. It, it was just a, uh, done this a few times, for this, and uh, but a moment struck me that hadn't before, which is the moment that Cadmus tells her to look at the sky. And I just thought, what a democratic thing that is. It's available to everyone. And somehow when she looks at that nothingness, she stops lying to herself about what's really going on. You know? And I, it's such an extraordinary moment that, so somehow that that shared moment of that very democratic blank frees her from denial, and then they talk to each other. Then she can say what happened, and he says, "This happened. Who killed him? You killed him." The the story can actually begin, and so maybe turning the corner is finding that thing that isn't anything in a way, just, and yet it's available to everyone to just stop. You don't maybe have to look right in the mirror, you know, it's, maybe it's just looking away for a moment to let it go and come back. And I just thought what a beautiful moment that is. Thank you so much. Thank you. The, the, um, word, the word amphitheater in Greek means I see you, you see me, and it's no coincidence that I see you, you see me happens outdoors under the sky. And I love that moment because it's in the center of a democracy that this story is being told in the fifth century in Athens, and everyone has access to each other in that space and to the sky. Um, we have time for maybe one last person to speak, and you, sir, are going to get the mic. No pressure. You're going to have the last word tonight. <laughs> To, to bring us all home with one beautiful statement, but I'm going to turn things over to you. Like you, Brian, I've um, studied this play for some time, and um, um, I love coming back to this play because it's such a difficult one to comprehend, um, not least because um, the character Dionysus isn't like a person. It's very difficult to understand his motivation. He has all these different sides, just as... Uh, people can behave all these different ways when they're when they're drunk. Dionysus is the god of wine, but 
Um, just tonight, it's helped me to understand the very end of the play. Um, and you're talking about the the um, the punishment that Cadmus and his wife are given. There's this strange moment when they're turned into snakes, and you think. What's the point of that? Why is Euripides turning these people into snakes? They haven't denied the divinity of the god. What, why does he have it in for them? Why doesn't Dionysus go off to the woods with his followers and just have a good time? Why does he have to punish these people so horribly? Um, and it still on me tonight that, that maybe what the end of the play means is that it's, this is not... Um, Dionysus is not just the god of wine. Dionysus is the god of fentanyl. And Dionysus is the god of these man-made opioids that are destroying our community. It's like um, the difference between a musket and a machine gun. The difference between a small bomb and an atom bomb. Like It's the difference between laudanum, which is what people talk in the, took in the 19th century, and... Um, these man-made drugs that are so many, many more times powerful. And we as human beings, we just don't know what we're doing with these drugs. And so when Cadmus and his wife are turned into snakes, it's like the vision of the end. I think it's Euripides at the end of the play saying, this is what we could become, particularly in America where, the, where, this, where this disease is so horrible. Um, um, if we are not careful, this drug will destroy innocent people like Cadmus and his wife, will turn them into snakes, will destroy not just the Pentheuses who've denied the divinity of the god, but will destroy everybody. Mm. Thank you. And listening to you talk, I really appreciate it. That's a really great last word. Um, I, I never thought of that, that, that um, uh, at least in the context of now, we've created Dionysus but it's Dionysus on steroids. It's Dionysus ex, you know, uh, exponentially more powerful than ever before. And so the questions in the fifth century about whether this was a god or whether this was a man or whether this was Euripides criticizing the gods or, or state religion or um, paying penance for being a cynic all his life actually sort of falls the wayside because uh, Dionysus is our creation. Um, we've, made, we've made the God in our own image with our own technology, and we're out selling it to everybody uh, through our charisma as a, as, a, as, a, as a nation, not just as a community. And um, You've given me a lot to think about. Um, it's been a really, really powerful night, um, and it doesn't end here. Um, before you leave, and I'm going to close out with a quick benediction, uh, we say at all the end of our performances, um, we'd just be grateful, but, and don't do it yet, if you could just fill out the survey that you have in your, um, and it's not a quid pro quo uh, for a cookie, but um, <laughs> but we just as we just be grateful, and then we can hand you a cookie and feel good about it. Um, uh, but before I go, I just want to say two quick things. One is um, that uh, if we had one message to deliver to you all from uh, Euripides uh, 2,500 years later, it's simply this. You're not alone in this room as evidenced by this conversation we've started but by no means finished. You're not alone across our country or the world. This is one of many performances of this project. We'll carry with us the spirit of what was said here and share it with other communities. Most critically, you are not alone across time. And if that's all you heard, that these struggles we've been talking about are as old as humanity itself, and it brings you some personal relief to see yourself reflected in this story in some way, then our work will have been well served. But if it, if, it, if it meant more to you and it leads to more discussion and more action, it galvanizes these already amazing six or seven organizations that are in this room doing the hard work day in and day out, or those of you who are in recovery, or those of you who are thinking about going into recovery, uh, or those of us who are comfortable in our distance from it all, who maybe get activated by an experience like this and get involved, uh, then it, it will have exceeded our expectations, but that's our hope that this leads to more and that you'll come back to more of our performances. At theaterofwar.nyc, you'll see another 25 performances over the next uh, five, four or five months throughout all five boroughs. They're all free. I hope you'll come to other boroughs, to homeless shelters, housing uh, developments, community centers, um, not just fancy places like WNYC, um, but to places where, uh, you know, we can have more real conversations with diverse audiences. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Before we close, I just want to thank our panel and our actors with one big round of applause.
Thank you so much. I hope you have a great night, and then we'll see you again very soon.